So in Italy, where there's a big family understanding, McGargles is Italy's our biggest export market for McGargles. Okay. But if we go across to the UK, Sonia, they can't pronounce it, right? <laughs> so if someone can't pronounce your brand uh, and they don't get it, well, then what's the point? So to this day, we don't sell McGargles in the UK. The Architects of Business with EY Entrepreneur of the Year, telling the inspirational stories behind Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. Hello and welcome to The Architects of Business, made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year, where you will hear the inspirational stories of some of Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Sonia Lennon, broadcasting remotely from my home at this time. And on this week's show, I chat with Tom Cronin, director of the Rye River Brewing Company, one of Ireland's biggest craft brewery success stories and home of the ever popular McGarrigal's brand. He talks to me about the power of early mentorship and the challenges and opportunities of COVID. If you haven't already done so, hit subscribe to get brand new episodes into your feed. Tom Cronin. Rye River Brewing Company. Thank you so much for joining us today on Architects of Business. Um, your story is uh, one of twists and turns, like all good entrepreneurs and all good entrepreneurial companies. Um, what, what I'd love to start with, because we do this with everybody, is to go back to the beginning, to little Tom, <laughs> and, and ask you a little bit about, um, I suppose, how you ended up so, so firmly set in this sector. What, what was the beginning of that? Um, I suppose the beginning, Sonia, goes back to uh, maybe when I was 15 or 16 years of age, um, getting a part-time job in a local hotel. Uh, I'm, I'm from North Cork originally, Charleville. Uh, there was a great uh, hotel in its day, the Deer Park Hotel. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to get a job there at 16. I got a, I got a bug for the hospitality industry, I think. And, uh, and that's probably where it all started. You know, I got a sense of of where people's skills come from. I got a sense of what hard work looks like. Um, it was one of these uh, enigmas that, you know, did 400 meals with Carvery on a Sunday, yet had 300, 400 people in a ballroom nightclub on a Saturday and Sunday night. And uh, it just, uh, just it was an exciting time for a young, young man, um, a few pounds in my pocket. So I probably got an appreciation for the value of money at a young age as well. Um, and it served me all the way through college, you know. Um, I went on through college to work in the hospitality industry as well. Um, and uh, tell, tell us a little bit about that because I know that um, you know that that great entrepreneurial spirit was at play very early on through your college years. Yeah. So look, I, I was always looking for not an angle, but um, for example, when I was in in university, I, I became clubs officer for two years and. Um, and that led me to sitting on boards and sitting on um, many entities probably that I wouldn't normally get exposed to. So you're, you're picking up experience sometimes subconsciously and, and subliminally, you know, and, and uh, all these things help you, I think, further in life and, and you, can, um, you, can, you, can, you can take from them. Um, I suppose in, in, in Maynooth, um, through, through being clubs officer, I, I went for a job for a, a student rep for Heineken. Um, and it was okay to have on-campus representatives for drinks entities, you know? Uh, and I did that for two years. Um, and I'd say that, that made you a popular human, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Back then, it was, it was great. You know, I got, a, I got a few quid every week. Um, I had access to a corporate brand at a very young age um, in college. Um, and, and you know what? Many things spiraled off it. I, I DJed for a while in college as a result. I was clubs officer, I was playing sports. It was a great time. But it, but it all fueled that desire to, uh, to stay in hospitality if I could or stay in an industry that, um, that, that allowed me to engage with people, um, you know, be, be interactive uh, with consumers. Um, and, and look, just a, a very exciting, uh, exciting time that, you know, probably to the detriment and demise of my mother because uh, I actually um, was doing a HDF in education at this stage. And I was back and forth to the US, any opportunity I got during those summers. So I did a J1 and then I went back and overstayed my visit in the second year. Then they opened up J2s, I went back again. And even on my fourth year, I went back and uh, I stayed for maybe four or five weeks because um, you know I just loved the States and uh, came home and I said, man, you know, um, 
I'm, I'm going working with Heineken. So Heineken had offered me a, a role straight from college and uh, I, I grabbed it with both hands. Um, you know, that was a, a day that uh, I remember my mom going, are you sure you don't want to be a teacher? You know, the stability of it <laughs> and everything. And, uh, you know, you've just spent the last four or five years, you know, getting your degree. And I was like, look, we see, I can always come back to teaching. And I, I think that's the, uh, that's the, that's, that's what's brought me to where I am, you know. That's- and can I ask you, because the, the one thing that, you know, through through these interviews with Architects of Business and, and through talking to the, all the EY Entrepreneur of the Year alumni, there, there, there are kind of pivotal moments. Um, and quite often it is that early exposure to a sector that, that, that ingrains it in you, you know. So whether that is, you know, whatever whether it's agriculture or hospitality or um technology and um, why did you why did you take that job was it circumstance was it just that the hotel was on your doorstep and it was a job available or was there mm. hospitality in your in your background so there's not hospitality uh yes and no my, my dad worked in the retail trade for 55 years for the same um employer um and and would have been highly regarded and well known throughout north cork for his his ability to engage with people and, and, and bring people in and make them feel special. And I probably grew up with that. Um, my dad in the early 70s would have um, been a fixer for ballroom dancers. So, uh, you know, he, he, he certainly had, um, you know, a, a very shy man in many ways, but um, it's obviously in me somewhere that there's this joy. Hang on, to, hang on, hang on. I have to ask a fixer yeah. for ballroom dancers. So, so he, he would have, he would have arranged back in the early, I'm, I'm assuming the sixties um, and the early seventies, my dad booked bands for what was the Deer Park Hotel in a different location in Charleville. I only found this out later in life. Um, you know, I, I was born in 1975. So pre, pre, pre my arrival, but um, yeah. You know, um, and to this day, my dad, who's now 83, um, loves organising Irish nights in a local uh, a local uh, pub, and and he'll he'll get ten twelve musicians together, and they'll do a song, they'll do a, you know a bit of poetry. Um, I'll go down every so often. I'll sing a song, you know, and and you know, eighty three he still has it. So um, it, you know, it was obviously in me. But to answer your question, um, I I came across this job because I was eager to get a few pounds in my pocket at a young age and and be independent, um, and. I was very fortunate to meet someone along the way, um, a lady called Rosari Sheehan. And you, you talk about mentors in life, and, and we're very fortunate within the alumni group to have um, such a wealth of knowledge and people who really care and will always look out for you. But at 16 years of age, I, I met a lady who was just the enigma of hospitality. And, you know, I just looked at this woman as people walked through the door, they became the most important guest in that hotel. And, uh, and, and I really said, okay, the key to success largely in life is how you treat people. And um, I, I probably, I've lived by that rule um, right through my life, you know, wherever I can, I, 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 I deal with the person in front of me and treat them with the respect they deserve and make them feel the way they should. And, um, and it served me well, you know, so keep people. What, what keep an still. important lesson. Yeah. yeah, what an important lesson to learn so so early. You were gifted that, no doubt about it. So now we know where the ENTS officer gene came from. It came from your father. Um, so, you know, you've, you've bitterly disappointed your mother by not deciding to become a teacher. Um, you're, you're hopping back and forth on your transatlantic travels. What happened next? So um, I was doing my HDIP exams in education and... Uh, I, I was, uh, as I said, a uh, student officer or, or um, Heineken represented on campus um, and clubs officer. And uh, a position came up in North Leinster based out of Navan. I'm in, currently in Maynooth. Haven't really lived in Charleville since my leaving cert in 1994. So um, I didn't have any uh, ambitions to, to head home for the summer. Uh, I've actually lined up a job um, in Cloyce de Breed, an all girls school in Clondalkin. So my, my, my path was laid out. And um, and you can ask me, would I interview for a role? And I said, yeah, certainly. So um, I was interviewing actually throughout my exams and um, I finished my uh, last exam in education on the Saturday and I started a full-time role with Heineken on the Monday. Uh, never forget it, up to the Arboyne Hotel in Navin. Uh, met my then boss, uh, Jerome O'Donovan, regional manager at the time. And uh, I got a Ford Mondeo uh, and a buzzer because there was no laptops back then and a fax machine and um 
and and all uh, mod cons. All all mod cons for a twenty one year old, you know. <laughs> so uh, I was like, my God, have I landed, you know? Uh, but I, I I got the best experience ever in drinks and 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 understanding business um, over the next few years with with that particular team and that that, and that company. Uh, in so far as they were building a territory, it was a it was a dominant uh, territory for another larger brand in Ireland at the time, and we had we had we had a tough job to to get market share. Um, it required a huge amount of uh, hard work, late nights, um, but had some great fun along the way. We we picked up uh, sponsorship rights for the Slain Festivals. So at a young age, I'm 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 living the dream in one way, you know. Um, Big and, time. And, and my my career progressed quite quickly within Heineken because I was eager. I was a uh, Okay, well, it wasn't the entrepreneurial um, road at that point, but I had the desire to try and make a name for myself within a big entity like um, Heineken, and 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 they were unbelievable at supporting that desire to uh, be better. And, and uh, so I, I got emerged into how to build brands the right way um, from a very early age as well, you know. And that's what I was going to ask you. So that um, foothold in in a global corporation must have been um very very um powerful in terms of when when the the entrepreneurial bug did hit uh, absolutely so you know i i'm in drinks and um I, I, over the next six seven years I, I i did a myriad of roles for for heineken um in managerial and, and ended up in in brands and um, speciality brands at the time and, and along the way, uh, in companies, uh, PLCs like that, you know, you, you're, you're getting nurtured, you're getting trained, um, you're, you're getting immersed in, in meetings and, and um, process that it's like a fast track MBA, you know, and, and I, maybe, maybe that was my MBA uh, in, 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 in drinks and brands um, without knowing it, you know, so um i found myself you know a few years later then um having to um move west um just for life choice i i, I currently live in the west garden in carrick and shannon and uh at, at that point um parted ways with heineken because um i i felt that i had really had a great six seven years but um i had a bug to do something different and, and that that was when i probably realized I'm never going to settle. I'll always be looking for something um, new and different. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Um, again, heart failure from my mom because I'm really well established in a great global company. Um, and, and I'm saying, actually, ma'am, I'm, I'm, I'm going <laughs> again. <laughs> you know, So um, I brought me to the West of Ireland and, and hosp- back into hospitality, you know. So what did that look like that then at that stage? So 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 that looked like setting up an entity called Northwest Bars Limited with a brother-in-law of mine. And over the next five years, we opened a lot of bars in uh, Ireland uh, and in it brought me back across the Atlantic to Denver, Colorado, where we had one of the, we had the largest Irish uh, pub um, in downtown Denver, 550 seater restaurant, um, became the largest purveyor of Guinness uh, within 12 months of opening. And a really exciting journey, you know, but um, wear and tear five years later. Um, it also included a nightclub in, in Sligo, uh, bars in Letterkenny, you know. So, you know, it was a crazy time. But again, you're just absorbing and learning and taking in everything. And, and more importantly, you're still dealing with people, hospitality. Um, you know, it, it was just a great time. You know? I mean, it, listening to you, Tom, it sounds like a, a, a snap decision overnight. All of a sudden, you have a chain of pubs. I'm sure it wasn't like that. No, it, it, and, it and it must have been. Um, it must have been uh, an absolutely brave new world stuff at the time to go from being an employee into being the the creator. What was the aha moment? I think the aha moment was realizing that consumer. Um, trends were were really changing um, and there was um, there was a movement where people were looking to savor a little more um, and it continues today if anything I think COVID-19 has has really brought that to the fore again um, and Molson Coors had just um, acquired the Francisco Well Brewery in Cork um, one of the longest established um, independent breweries uh, set up by Shane Long a great guy um, and there was a, a, a realization, okay, the, the, the industry is changing. So do I stay where I am and, and, uh, and build it for someone else? Or, or do we take a chance and, and, uh, and go at craft beer ourselves? And that's what we did, you know? So um, June, June 13, 
Um, July 13, maybe I gave my notice, and by October 1st or October 31st, we had a, we had an office in Kilcock, and uh, I was uh, I was in there figuring out um, what we would do uh, to get um, a brand movie in Ireland. You know. And how clear was your your, your collective vision at that stage? Because obviously, you had been informed by uh, you know big corporate uh, sort of visions before that were you going big from the get-go um well um Niall and Alan ha- had very big visions to be fair and uh you know I bought into it as well to answer that um our our our, our logo on the back of our t-shirt back in 2000 and late 13 or 14 the first uh polo shirts we got embroidered was uh the best little brewery in the world right um so is that bold? Absolutely. Is it ambitious? Yes, because there's um, 63 other craft breweries in Ireland uh, when we set up. Um, we have no brew house. We have a concept for a brand that's quirky and different. Um, and, uh, and, and, and yet our ambition is to be the best little brewery in the world, you know. Um, so the ambition was definitely big. Um, was the um, roadmap planned out and, and locked down? No because I don't think you can ever have that, but the ambition was certainly there, you know? Um, and, you know, last year we, we became crowned um, the most uh, decorated independent craft brewery in the world at the 2019 World Beer Awards. So maybe sometimes you need that big ambition um, to see it through. And I, I believe last year that Roy River hit that, uh, that, that goal and ambition, you know? So yes, Absolutely the ambition was right. Good. I think it needs to be. We're going to take a short break um, and we're, when we come back, we're going to have a little chat about the, the twists and turns that came from there on in. Yeah, great. Tom Cronin, Rye River Brewing Company. Um, you've set up this vision, you have your ambition, three guys gung-ho. Um, the early years of that, what did it look like? Uh, look, it, it, was, it was manic, Sonia, um, unbelievable hard hours um, you know a lot of fear and all the anxiety that goes with cash flow management and everything that um, any entrepreneur will tell you they have to go through you know it was no different for our Rubin company you know but you hit a crux right you hit a point where um, you know the success wasn't heading in the right direction right yeah, so um, we 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 came in with an ambition to be the best little brewery in the world, and and um, rightly or wrongly, um, we we took on agency brands, and 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 I'm going to say lost focus. Um, I, I'm not going to say intentionally lost focus, but we got more distracted with someone else's brand than our own business, and along the way, took poor decisions um, in terms of investing into markets maybe that were just beyond our reach for such a young uh, brand. Um, and, and it led us into a bit of difficulty in 2016. Um, you know, we'd scaled up very quickly. Um, and mid-2016, we had taken in a round of investment. Um, and by October, it re- we realized that, okay, this isn't enough. We're, we're, something's got to change. So um, without getting into the, the, the murky details of it, um, by January 17, um, I was the only remaining founder left. and. Uh, and realized, okay, we, we've got to change everything here. And, um, and that's what we started doing. So, so enough about the, the, the problems. Let's talk about the solutions and what came out of that reshuffle. Um, I mean, apart from the human element, you found yourself then in the driving seat uh, with a, a sort of a, a restructured um, organization. Um, what were your focus points there at this time where you knew that focus was critical? So um, the first thing was, I suppose, to um, go back to our ambition, which was to be a really credible craft brewery in Ireland, uh, independent, um, standalone, with a clear focus and goal. So in 2017, in January 2017, set about putting in a new um, senior leadership team. So empowered myself with really great people, some of whom were already in the business, um, put in a really good board with experience. Um, got lenders on side um, because, you know, it's, it's inevitable that there's that moment when uh, you have to go back to your lender and say, um, I need you to help us out here again. Um, and there's a bit of pain in that for everyone. 
So it was it was really getting a, a back then a five year plan and a vision to say, look, we we can deliver this. You know, we we believe we have the brands, we believe we have the people, um, and and you know that doesn't happen overnight. You've you've got to be you've you've got to get confidence uh, with everyone around you. So you know you're asking individuals to back you and your vision, um, and, and yet you're in very murky waters. So it, it takes months and, and years really to build that trust back up. Um, so 17, by the end of 17, we had, um, we'd gone from heavy loss making in 2015 and 14, 15 and 16 um, to um, making profit on an EBITDA line within 12 months. Now, by doing so, uh, we took really tough decisions. Um, we got rid of all agency brands uh, mm -hmm. amicably. Um, again, which is a, which was a huge distraction and, and and challenge at the time because you're in contractual agreements with uh, multinational brands and 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 you're trying to unravel those, uh, but it worked. So um, 17 was a really really tough year, but a defining year for the business because we we grew market share domestically, we grew market share uh, in export markets for for, for our own brands. Um, uh, at this point, we had a we had a portfolio of of, of, of brands between McGargles and our exclusive retailer brands. So we have Crafty Brewing Company that we do for Lidl. We have Solus, which we exclusively do for Tesco. Uh, Grafters for Dunn Stores, and 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 we were doing really well. You know, we were we were becoming very focused in terms of quality and consistency, which I've always maintained. Um, you know, brands brands bring people into a, a, a liquid irrespective of who you are in, and you know, whether you're a Heineken or a Guinness or Carlsberg, the branding is there to entice you in to trial. It's the liquid that brings you back for repeat purchase. So our core focus in 17 was restructure the business, refocus, and the biggest focus needed to be on quality and consistency and process. And, uh, and, and that's what's led us to the success I believe we've had over the last few years, you know? And what were the key lessons then around branding? Because regardless, if, if, if you're in business or if you're an entrepreneur or if you're even interested in business, you know, that, that um, everybody needs to think about branding, even if you're an individual at this stage. So, mm -hmm. so what were the takeouts? So we, we had to realize that while we had a very quirky brand um, in McGargan, for example, it was a bit of Marmite. Not everyone got it. Uh, it's based on a dysfunctional Irish family. It, you know, it was disruptive back in 2013, 2014. I think it was a bit a bit tired by 2017, so um, we engaged uh, we engaged uh, uh, an agency and we said, okay, look, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater because we, we, it was doing really well in Ireland, but um, it, it 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 was just a bit too far quirky for me and, and for the team around me, and we 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 tried to bring quality hues into the signage and and the branding and and I think that worked. So we we took. I think we had 32 different messages on our label at the time and we stripped it back to six or seven and we 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 focused in on provenance and quality and awards so we put, we put a, a strong brand stamp on it a defined brand stamp we put provenance so um, you know kill their crafted became one of our sayings um we kept the character because we had actually launched two SKUs along the way when we were trying to fix the business in seven in 17 and, and we got a, a lot of backlash from consumers going, Where, where's the characters gone? So we were like, okay, that doesn't work. Um, so we were kind of feeling our way through it. And, um, you know, by the end of 17, in the midst of everything else, we had, um, we had fixed, when I say fixed, we had addressed uh, brand concerns around McGargles. And, uh, and we could see the results immediately. More and more people were engaging and accepting it, you know. Um, look, right now, McGargles is possibly the largest uh, retail brand in Ireland in craft beer. Um, so it's proven that you know brand work is continuous. Uh, Sonia, you know we we yeah. continuously go back to McGargles and tweak and, and and play with it. And uh, last week we launched two new four pack NPDs. We're still developing the brand, you know. So um, it's an endless um, it's an endless uh, road when it comes to branding, you know. And is McGargles um, a key export brand for you? Um, yes, in certain countries. So again, you learn. I mean. Um, I think part of our success over the last few years is our ability to adapt really quickly. Um, I'll give you two examples and, and it'll probably tie back in here. In 2018, we received a large export order um, uh, an opportunity from, from Lidl to bring the Crafty Brewing Company to 17 countries. Um, and that, that, that came to light around October. By November, we had funded um, through um, Dunport, 
um, our lender uh, to this day, um, um, incremental um, funding to allow us uh, invest in CapEx and working capital. Um, by January 3rd, we had six new tanks in the premises. And by March 31st, we had shipped a huge amount of volume to 17 countries on time in full with the highest quality. Um, so, you know, that, you know, that wouldn't happen in big business because there's too many layers of, of scrutiny and checks, you know, whereas we put our head down and for six months, we really, really focused on, 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 on delivering this. Um, okay, so is McGargan's our brand of choice for export? Over the last few years, we've realized that it absolutely resonates and works in some countries. So in Italy, where there's a big family understanding, McGargan's is, Italy's our biggest export market for McGargan's, okay? But if we go across to the UK, Sonia, they can't pronounce it, right? <laughs> so if someone can't pronounce your brand uh, and they don't get it, well, then what's the point? So to this day, we don't sell McGargles in the UK. Uh, you know, I wonder, is McGargles the, the, <laughs> the ultimate matriarchal beer then, is it? <laughs> I, I don't know, but what, what it did make us realize is we have, um, we have unbelievable, we, we brew 32 unique, unique recipes um, every other week in the brewery. So, you know, we're a complex, busy brewery that brews in two and a half thousand litre batches, small batches. Um, and we realized that there's, you know, we're trying to push water up a hill. It's, it's, you know what, it's okay to have brands that don't resonate in every country. It's absolutely fine. Yeah. So we, we've gone with a new approach to the UK and pre-COVID had just launched a new brand and it seems to have been doing very well. Um, but it won't be McGargles, you know, but McGargles will absolutely continue to, to, to sell in other European countries. And, and right now, um, if, I, if I just jump ahead to where COVID has brought us, um, our market share and our market gains for our brands in Ireland has, is at an all-time high. Um, look, we're fortunate to be deemed an essential service, and, and that became apparent. And, and look, we took all the necessary steps, and it's been a very tough 12 weeks for everyone in the brewery, or 14 weeks. Um, but what we have realized is McGargles as a brand in Ireland is just going from strength to strength every year. It, 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 it's, it's market share gains. It's a, it's a category leader in craft beer in Ireland, and and it's it's, it's there's nothing wrong with it, you know. Um, when I say there's nothing wrong with it, the brand <laughs> the brand resonates. People trust it, you know. Yeah. So, so how, how how many? So COVID in general has has been good to you as a company, um, yeah, but you well, have a huge yeah. facility. Sorry, uh, go on. No, I, I, so COVID has has been extremely challenging, and I, I know you know not making light of COVID. What COVID did was it made us again go back to that, uh, you know, that comment I had about being able to react and being agile. And um, again, you know, uh, in early March, we sat around the table and we recut our 2020 plan. And our first prognosis was that we were going to drop revenue maybe 20% because our, our business is made up of four channels, Sonia. We have export business. We have uh, exclusive export business, which is largely around Cracky Brewing Company um, and, uh, and, and contractual volume that goes in at certain times into beer promotions around Europe. Mm -hmm. um, we have an on-premise business in Ireland, which had 12% growth last year, um, albeit that it only represented maybe 9% of our overall business. It, it, it's, it's a very focused channel that had three direct, uh, four, four direct employees working in it. And then we have our retail business. So when COVID came, two of our channels for revenue closed down overnight. And you have to be dynamic and, and react quickly. So, um, you know, I, I realized back in early March that whatever hope we had of, of maintaining some level of uh, profitability this year, um, we had to keep the business open. So we, we took COVID really seriously from the very start in terms of social distancing and everything. But we also decided that we doubled down on retail. And um, all the employees, there's actually seven employees in, in Rye River Brewing Company um, at the moment uh, currently getting the payment subsidy because they would not have a job had not we redirected them into other channels. So, for example, our national sales manager for uh, OnTrade is now driving a van opening up independent channels um, in, in outlets that we've never traded in. So, you know, we adapted, we changed our model. Um, and as a result, you're right, COVID has been kind to our room company in terms of demand for our beers. But the challenge... In because you did the right thing, though, because, because you were we, ready to move. Because we reacted and we reacted swiftly and we reacted with a bit of courage. And, and look, I, I, you know, I, I owe a lot of gratitude to all the employees in Royal River Brewing Company because 
Uh, eight of them have called to uh, 10 or 12 stores every day throughout COVID and risked, you know, a lot of, of, of their own um, personal um, safety, uh, albeit, yes, they have PPE. But um, when we go into a store now, we, we don't only pull our own brands because we've realized that for the last uh, 10 or 12 weeks that uh, retail has been under huge pressure. So where we can, we, we not only go in and, and pull and drag our own stock, but if there's some other brands from competitors out back um, and, and, uh, and we're asked to help, we help. So, you know, you can only do it with people. So go back to the Deer Park Hotel and when I was 16 years of age and realizing the importance of, of, of Rosari Sheehan and, and how she made me feel like the most important employee as a 16 year old. I, I, that's resonating with me now. You know, we, we, we have a great team and uh, COVID's been good to me and been good to Rye River Broom Company because we have great people. Can, can I ask you then, because, you know, the, the best little brewery in the world is, isn't so little anymore. So, so you know, how, how many staff have you got? The facility, obviously, you've spoken a little bit about. This is big business, you know. It's, it's not for nothing that you're here on the mm-hmm. EY Entrepreneur of the Year podcast, you know. It's, you know, at what point does, you know, the best little brewery become one of the big guys? Um, well, we're still, we're, you know, yes, we have, we have, large volume going through the brewery now i mean uh, i'm I, i'm very comfortable talking we're selling about uh, thirty thousand hectoliters you know a, a year um but we do it in two and a half a thousand liter batches so <laughs> it's an enigma we're, we're busy sonia rather than big if i could say that um we we brew around the clock on a small brew house that allows us to have really consistent high quality um liquid um, and we, I'm very fortunate to have an unbelievable brew team of nine brewers who work eight hour shifts, who lift 25 kg bags on every shift. There's nothing modern or um, big about Rye River Brewing Company other than we're very busy um, and we work hard. And, uh, and, and volume is not what defines um, uh, you know, whether you're big or not. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's the quality and consistency and, and uh, the fact that we, we work around the clock, keep beer um, supplied. Um, uh, yeah, look, we're getting bigger um, and we'll have to change uh, in time and we'll have to invest and there's a plan for that. Um, but I'd say we're busy rather than big. <laughs> okay, you know? good answer. Good <laughs> answer, Tom. Um, but but as I said, you are, you are big and um, you are uh, a member of the Entrepreneur of the Year alumni. What, that process, it must have been, uh, given that it's only three years since you were in crisis, um, it must have been a phenomenal validation to be part of that process. It was, and uh, I, I think I acknowledged that last year in, in, in one of the clips. Like It, it, was, um, it was like being recognised by um, industry for having tenacity and having a will and a belief. You know, um, but it, it wasn't my tenacity. It's not my will. Um, I, I might be steering the ship, but um, you know, it's 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 the people around me, um, Sonia. And, and that's not cliched. You know, um, you you require people that buy into visions and dreams, um, and and question when they have to question, but ultimately get on board. And I was very fortunate in two thousand and seventeen to have, as I said, a dedicated. Um, team of uh, a senior team around me of six or seven people uh, aboard um, who bought into the vision um, at Dunport um, and uh, uh, you know a non-exec in a chair who really uh, understood what what we were trying to do so it's a collective it's a collective drive but you're right the EY acknowledgement um, certainly um, was a proud moment for all of us you know. Looking forward then in terms of um, the d- drinks industry as a whole, um, you know, you're facing into a new future now post-COVID um, as a sector. What, what are the biggest challenges that are faced? Um, well, look, the whole world is, is, is changing and social distancing is going to be the norm, you know. So there are certain sectors and industries that, that certainly will have to adapt more than others. Um, if I take the positive from COVID-19 for, for small manufacturing um, companies like Rye River in Ireland, who um, are fortunate enough to be doing really high-end quality food produce um, or drink produce, 
Um, the movement has definitely, the, the whole world has slowed down over the last 12 weeks, uh, except in essential services, right? <laughs> um, but the whole world has slowed down and, and we're saving things more than ever before. I, you know, um, one of the big call outs for me over the last few weeks is um, uh, the inability to get flour in a shop. Why can't we get flour in a shop? Because everyone now is taking up home baking, they're baking scones, slowing down. And, and that provides opportunity for companies like Rye River Brewing Company, where people are willing to pay more and drink less. Um, so in my particular industry, I believe that craft beer will have a resurgence as a result of the pandemic. Um, I believe that people are savoring the experience and they're more than happy to sit out back with this glorious weather and have two or three craft beers, maybe have different ABVs, different taste profiles, um, and, 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 and they're willing to pay more for that. But they're savoring the moment and they may be having their fresh bread that they baked earlier that day or a cheese board that they picked up in, in a local um, shop. Um, so, Tom, that, you're making me both hungry and thirsty now yeah. at this stage. <laughs> so, so look, um, you know, that, 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 does that mean uh, big brands um, won't, won't, won't do really well? Of course they will. But there's a new discerning audience out there, and we see it in the demand. We've never had greater demand for beers um, domestically. So there is more and more consumers picking up our products than ever before, and, and COVID has facilitated that, you know. Uh, and yet, look, there's a huge challenge in us trying to satisfy the supply chain, um, which, uh, you know, I'd like to acknowledge the retailers in Ireland. They've all been uh, very understanding with the demand that's been put on SMEs in Ireland. And, and fortunately, we've been able to satisfy demand uh, up to now. Um, however, if this weather and demand continues, you know, it'll, it'll put challenges on businesses like um, uh, Royal River Brown Company, you know. Just, just before we leave, I'd love to get a sense of what's in your head um, in five years' time for, for your fabulous company. So we currently employ 53 um, people, Sonia, and um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a hard graft brewery. Um, you know, there is um, an absolute requirement for us to um, satisfy future growth and demand and, and in return invest. Um, and we're we're scoping that out at the moment, but our 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 three year plan is is very ambitious, um, and it hasn't changed since last year. Um, COVID has certainly thrown us curveballs, um, and 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 with two of our channels now um, non eventful in terms of revenue, um, will certainly make make my three year plan a little more difficult. But our ambition is to double our profit by twenty twenty three, and and we're still on that's still the goal. You know, um, investment is required to do it. But we're taking the right steps. We just uh, we we just closed out a sale lease back on our premises, um, and uh, we were very fortunate that that had not closed out pre COVID. But uh, we managed to get it over the line in early March, and um, so you know we we've just paid down some debt. Um, so we're we're doing things as we had planned last year. Uh, COVID has certainly thrown us a few curveballs, but uh, our plan is still our plan. Um, and we'll tweak it, but our, our, our three-year and five-year ambition is, is still very much alive. You know, I don't doubt it for a minute. Tom Cronin, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today and uh, looking forward to watching your future success. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening and watching The Architects of Business, made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. Thanks to the whole team here at Joe and of course to our entrepreneur Tom Cronin of Rye River Brewing Company. If you haven't already done so, click subscribe to get new shows directly into your feed.